Hi everyone, we're in Village Hall today and I'm here with Dolly Foster. She is the horticulturist for the Oaklawn Park District. Hello Dolly, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Good, Beth. thanks for coming by on uh, short notice relatively. Um, we met I think last week to talk about something really exciting that we're going to ask you to work on with us yes. uh, in the Village of Oaklawn. But the main topic, you know, spring is coming. Spring is almost here. We're starting to see the plants come up. And, right. and uh, with that comes the flowers and the bugs, and especially later on in the season, the butterflies. butterflies yes. And we're going to talk about monarch butterflies and Village of Oaklawn, what we can do to help them. Right. So, so tell me a little bit about your monarch fest that you had last year. Monarch Fest was um, started out as an idea by one of our employees. <clears throat> There's several of us who raise monarch butterflies every summer, mm -hmm. and um, one of our employees decided that it might be a good idea if we expanded some of the education that we were doing for monarchs. And so Monarch Fest started um, just as this little tiny seed, and it turned out to be a fantastic education program. Award winning, right? Award winning. So yes, what award did, did you win? We won the outstanding event award for the Illinois Parks and Recreation So in the whole state they recognize yes. this event as yes. being something just Pretty amazing. Special. So what yeah. went on at this event? We had, uh, it was an indoor and outdoor event. We had um, myself and a few volunteers were tagging butterflies, monarch butterflies, for the migration with kids who came there with their parents and that was a lot of fun. We had a plant sale, native plants, milkweed, things like that that monarchs mm -hmm. need. And then we had an indoor part where there was a number of people who came to share what they do and, and with the monarchs and pollinators and how they uh, raise their caterpillars because we're encouraging people to raise caterpillars. Just a few every year would be fine. So this is a fall event, right? It is. But yes. You, you mentioned the word migration. Now I think of migration, I think of birds migrating, right. you know, the, 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 the um, robins. Right. You know, first sign of spring you see the robins. Right. That's right. how I knew the weather was breaking. I'm exactly. like, okay, the birds know more than the weatherman. <laughs> yes. The robins are back, spring right. is here. So do bugs migrate? Uh, there are a number of different species of butterflies that migrate, and the monarch butterfly is the one that migrates in the greatest number. So a butterfly, Weighs as much as a paper clip. Yeah, there's there's so little to it. How far do they migrate? From Chicago, monarch butterflies migrate 2,500 miles, and they have to come do that on in two months. Okay, so if you see a monarch butterfly in your backyard this summer, mm -hmm. it's going to end up in two months when it migrates. Next, yeah. In, to Mexico. Yeah, if it's a butterfly that you see after Labor Day, it will be a, a butterfly that goes to Mexico. Only specific ones go to Mexico. The late ones. Wow, mm -hmm. wow. So what's the average life of, I mean, I, I, do they live year to year like birds? and? Uh, they do not. Um, okay. The, the butterflies right now are exiting Mexico. They're heading towards Texas. The females are all pregnant. We call that gravid females. And those females are going to lay their eggs. And it will be, they'll live about another six weeks. And then their progeny will live about six weeks after they go through the full process and then so, six weeks. so three generations to get to Chicago. Okay so one generation flies to Mexico 2,500 yes. miles. How do they know? We are not exactly sure but the the best thing that we can surmise so far and there's lots of people doing this kind of research trying to figure it out um, is that the Mexico the mountains in Mexico the Sierra Madres are um, or rich with iron and so they think it's a magnetic thing. That's amazing. So okay so one generation goes back but it takes three generations then to come back to Chicago. Yes and then a little so, bit more even to get up to northern Ontario which is their northern. So they go to Canada too. Yeah they do. <laughs> so okay so I'm trying to figure this out. So one generation goes down all these generations come back every six weeks a new generation moves further on this march yeah. mm -hmm. and and <coughs> how much population do they need to sustain that kind of movement because well that's a good question we need um, we need a, a, a good sustainable population of 300 million monarch butterflies to keep this migration alive and keep it coming every single year. The point of the migration is for the butterflies to come up into the Midwest, 
which is their breeding grounds for the summer, and every generation <coughs> builds the population a little more, a little more, a little more, a little more, and then that last generation is a huge generation that goes back to Mexico. This year the population is only 148 million. Mm -hmm. So it's a little low. Um, there was a very bad winter storm last spring, mm -hmm. a year ago, and that knocked back the population quite a bit. And we were on an upswing. So we're hoping that this year with the mild winter, the mild weather, mm -hmm. although I, I hear that things are kind of going sideways in Texas right now, but we're hoping that the weather will improve and uh, so the butterflies will have a okay. better trip up. So, so you're, you're working with us this year to try to build that population yes. up. So what <coughs> makes the population grow? Is it, is it, you know, you want to be welcoming and all yes. of that. So I imagine that's habitat, right? Yes. So habitat is the most important thing. It, it, raising monarchs at home is not the most important thing for this conservation program. It is having habitat. And if we all have habitat in our backyards, in our parks, um, on city property, churches and schools, those are pocket habitats and those act as bridges between natural areas from one natural area to another. So these pocket habitats are super important and with the monarch butterfly milkweed is the most critical plant and um, that's why we give it away at Earth Day, we give it away at Fourth of July, we sell it at Monarch Fest for a fundraiser and um, I give away seeds and all year long and, and so I just try and disseminate as much as possible. So you mentioned the word bridges of, for the migration yes. or so, so let's say the, the monarchs are coming up from Texas, they're in Missouri now mm -hmm. and there's no milkweed in, yes. in Missouri. So they have so. to expend extra energy and they want to lay eggs so badly it's, it's um, I mean, it's a compulsion. They, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like me eating popcorn, have to eat popcorn. They have to <laughs> lay their eggs. And so they are seeking it out. They can smell milkweed within a mile. Wow. And if they can't find any, they have to keep traveling. They have to keep trying to recharge themselves with nectar and, and keep traveling. So the more milkweed that we have in as many places and as, as much milkweed uh, rich environment that we can provide for them, all the better to make it easier for them to mate and lay more eggs. If they're weakened, they're going to lay less eggs. Sure. So, so, and then the eggs, when they hatch, need to eat the milkweed also, they do. right? They so, do. okay. So, so, um, what we're asking then, um, as part of this initiative, is for everyone to have a little bit of milkweed growing on their property. Yes. And milkweed, when I grew up, was a weed, and, yes. you know, <laughs> People would say, no, we don't want that here. Right. And, but I, I do remember growing up an abundance of butterflies. Yes. In my childhood, I remember watching the caterpillar, seeing that whole cycle of life, mm -hmm. and it was just something you saw outside your door. It was very common. And, very and common. It, it is less common. If I yes. see a monarch, I, I see just a few all season, mm -hmm. I would say. Yeah. Um, but so if, if residents plant the milkweed just in a corner, maybe next to the garage, yeah. part of the garden that they Absolutely. don't know what to do with. Absolutely. This is going to make a big difference in the Huge. survival of the monarch butterfly. Huge. And there's more to life than just the one type of milkweed that we're all very familiar with from, mm -hmm. you know, seeing it out on roadsides and things like that. That's common milkweed. It is a relatively aggressive plant when you put it into a home garden. It'll spread a lot, it'll come up in the lawn and things like that and for some people it's not the right plant for that place. So there's other types of milkweed that are also suitable for caterpillars and those would be things like swamp milkweed and poke milkweed. Where do you um, get that? At our plant sale okay. at Monarch Fest. So you're also going to be at Earth Day. When is Earth Day? Earth Day is April 29th. And where, is, where is Earth Day? It's going to be at Wolf Wildlife Refuge okay. from 10 to 2. And I remember last year you guys were giving out milkweed plants. We were giving away tropical milkweed, and that's also a good milkweed, but we encourage everybody to um, capture your seeds. Don't let your seeds just uh, burst and fly away. That's what milkweed seeds do. Uh, tropical milkweed is not a native, so we would like it to not end up in our natural areas. So you can grow it. It's great for caterpillars, uh, but we need to capture the seeds and not let them fly. Okay. Important. Okay, I didn't know that. So, so at what point? So, do the monarchs need the seed pods for anything, or once they grow, uh, no. you just snip them off? We just snip them off. Sometimes okay. uh, my caterpillars and other people do feed uh, seed pods to their caterpillars. They do like it, and they okay. like the flowers too. So okay. they'll eat all parts of the plant. 
Now, it, it, it is kind of a beautiful plant. I think it is. Um, and they grow well also in containers. So mm -hmm. if you wanted maybe on your porch or yeah. something like that, do they need a lot of sunlight? They need as much sunlight as possible. Okay. I think poke milkweed and spider milkweed are, are two lesser known natives. Um, they can take a little bit more shade. But if you wanted to grow common milkweed at home to be able to feed caterpillars and encourage them, you can grow it in a planter cut it down in the fall, put it in your garage, water it once during the winter, bring it back out, and you have common milkweed again. Wow. Yeah. So it's... it's um, Hardy. It's very hardy. <laughs> That's good. That's good. I don't think anybody would argue with me about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Um, I've seen residents grow it on the side of their, their house. Yes. Um, yeah. Kind of in that dead man's yeah. area where you can't really grow anything else because it's yeah. so dry and hot. Uh, common milkweed does do well there. It's very but tough. that makes a big, big difference then for these butterflies because if, if they have habitat, they'll, they'll lay more eggs they will. and we'll have more, more butterflies. Right. So if you see eggs on a plant, what do they look like or what are they? They are extremely small. The eggs are about as big as a, the top of a pin, a, a top of a stray wow. pin. Wow. So they're very small, but um, I find that when I'm out looking for eggs at home, you flip that leaf over and you're looking for the eggs. The eggs kind of sparkle in the sunshine, so you can tell the difference between an egg and then just a little dot of milkweed sap. So they're not, once you're familiar, they're not hard to see. And you can always um, contact me through the park district if you find a bunch of eggs on your milkweed and you don't want to raise the eggs. I have people who can and who will do it. So people who can means they take the eggs, put them on their own milkweed plants? Or Actually, how we take them in and we raise them indoors to protect them from spiders and stink bugs and things that will eat them. Okay. Okay. So they have a lot of predators attacking yes. them as well. Yes. Okay. Um, only 1% of all monarch eggs that are laid from each female um, actually make it to the wing stage. Wow. So it's a pretty low, um, pretty, wow. pretty low. It's, it's amazing. Amount. Yeah. I, I'm just in awe of the migration thing. <clears throat> I don't know if everyone knows that. Now, there's a movie out. Yes. That, um, what is that movie called? The movie just came out on Blu-ray. It's called Flight of the Butterflies. It was a movie that was at the IMAX Theater at the Science and Industry Museum about two years ago. And it is a beautiful movie, and it follows the story of Dr. Fred Urquhart from Canada. He's, he was interested in monarch butterflies back in the 1930s when he was a young boy. And he followed through and researched them all the way through his life up until the butterfly uh, sanctuary was found in Mexico in 1975 by two volunteers that he had enlisted. Uh, it took them two years to find it. And also the movie goes through the monarch uh, life stages and explains the life stages. And it's, um, it's just a really beautiful movie. So this would be a great movie for families to watch mm -hmm. who might want to have yes. a butterfly garden. Absolutely. And, and so besides milkweed, are there any plants that also encourage habitat to, you know? There are. Um, and when we're talking about monarch butterfly gardens, we're talking mostly about native plants. And native plants sometimes get a bad rap for looking very wild in a garden. But you can plant certain species like um, coneflowers and blazing star. There are certain varieties of goldenrod that are uh, pretty tame and mm -hmm. aren't going to run through your whole garden. And then New England aster. And the goldenrod and the New, New England aster are critical species for the fall migration because they have very, very rich nectar that the butterflies need on their way down to Mexico. And they follow that bloom line all the way down to Mexico So from Canada. when you say bloom line, tell me what you mean by that. Well, when the butterflies are up in Canada, they know when it's time to migrate because the milkweed is starting, the leaves are starting to turn yellow, they're senescing and uh, going dormant for the year. And at the same time, the New England aster, the goldenrod are coming into flower, the sun is at a certain angle, nights are getting cooler, and they start migrating and following uh, the New England aster and the goldenrod blooming all the way south through Texas. So as it comes in and out of bloom, they're following that line. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty cool. You don't think of things like that when no. you plan your garden. <laughs> no. You think, oh, I think these two colors would look good right. together. Oh, right. I think, you know, um, I never tried this plant, let me try it. Right. But right. what you're suggesting residents think of when they plan their garden is, is 
Plant for Purpose. Plant for Purpose. Okay, so repeat those plant names again. We want Coneflowers, we want Blazing Star, which is Liatris, we want Goldenrod, and we want New England Aster, and other kinds of asters. And then there are some annuals that are really good, and then of course we need monarch. Uh, we need milkweed. milkweed. So, yeah. so those plants you just listed off, except milkweed, bloom late in summer, correct? They do. And so Most of them. those plants have the more potent nectar yes. for that 2,500 mile yes. Yes. flight. Because, like, uh, how, do, how does that butterfly fly? 25, it's just a miracle. It, I well, can't even. They, they put on half of their body weight. So think about being a human being and putting on half your body weight. Oh, it's I think about that all the time. <laughs> oh, I think about that all the time. <laughs> it's a horrifying thought for most humans. But for the butterflies, they need to put on 50% of their body weight as they are going down to Mexico so that they can be dormant during the winter. Um, and they just kind of uh, hang out in the trees and um, in the mountains in yeah. uh, the Sierra Madres. But what the... The way they get down to Mexico is they do a lot of gliding up on the thermals, okay. and they follow the natural winds that are bringing winter down, okay. Okay. And, um, and they do the same thing in reverse on the way up. So they try and conserve as much energy as possible. Because I think of the anatomy of a bird and how, mm -hmm. you know, um, I mean, there's a lot of muscles that carry that yes. bird. Yes, and I the mean, butterflies have muscles too. They have, monarchs have the largest wing muscle, I think, of most butterflies wow. because of their long flight. Now tell me about the pattern. Why do they have such a distinctive pattern? And is the pattern like a fingerprint <coughs> unique between each butterfly, or is it a standard kind of? There is almost no variation from monarch to monarch, except that uh, male monarchs have extra two extra dots on their wings to show that they're males. It's a pheromone gland. Uh -huh. uh, but as far as the rest of the patterning on the wings, they're almost identical. And what that is, is a screaming red flag to all other creatures in nature that the monarch butterfly is poisonous and don't eat me. And so the funny thing is, is that the viceroy butterfly has evolved right next to the monarch butterfly. But the <laughs> viceroy is a little smaller, it looks a lot like the monarch, but it's not poisonous. But it is mimicking their pattern because everything else in nature knows that you can't eat monarchs because you'll get sick. Huh. And so they've kind of very cleverly adopted that pattern. So if you see a monarch in your backyard. Jump for joy. Jump for joy. <laughs> you know, I know kids always want to try to catch butterflies. Does yes. that kill them? It does not. You know, not. if you touch the wings yeah. and then let them go, it does not? It does not kill them. But I think it would be very um, very challenging to catch a butterfly. Monarchs are very fast flyers. Uh -huh. and they have they, to be, my yeah, God. They don't necessarily want to be caught. Okay. So, um, you can try, but I, I encourage most gardeners and people who are enthusiastic about insects to please take pictures, don't capture them, um, don't put them in a killing jar and pin them to a piece of styrofoam. We have enough dead samples of monarchs in the world that we don't need to be collecting them. Uh, collecting pictures is the way to go to nowadays. That's great. Yeah. That's great. And so you and I are also on a little mission to try to get these plants at our local yes. um, uh, garden, garden stores. Yep. Um, so, you know, we're hoping, you know, by the time you're getting your plants for your garden that you'll see little containers that say, you know, this is a butterfly garden right. container or these are the plants, somehow identifying them. Right. And that'll help you remember all those fancy Latin names you just read <laughs> off. Um, yes. <coughs> you know, uh, you know, it's, it's awesome to do this. We, we are so excited. And this is actually a mayor's initiative, uh, and, and we're joining with other mayors to try yes. to, to, to grow this habitat. All across the country. Yeah, yes. so, so it's a movement we're very proud to be part of in Oak Lawn. And, uh, you know, so Earth Day, you could get your plants, and yes. those are free. Yes. Those uh, are free. Well, or, the perennial milkweed I sell for a dollar okay. just, just so I have the chance to interact with Good. the patrons and tell them that it's perennial um, so and make if, sure they know what they're buying. If you know someone who has milkweed, you could get the seeds from them you also. Can. Yes. And try, and, and how do you, if you have just seeds, do you just put them on, on the ground and nature takes care of you it? You can, yes. Or do you put the, do you, Put, do you there's, start seedlings like you would? There's a lot of different ways to start them, um, and you at this time of the year you can just put them outside. It'll take a while for them to germinate, yeah. but um, so you'll have milkweed for next year. So the best thing to do for this year is to get a hold of the plants. That's the best way to do it. Okay, and so 
<clears throat> we're hoping in Oak Lawn to have plenty of habitat for that migration to Canada right. and the migration back to Mexico. And uh, it's pretty, pretty cool to talk about. It's not something you think about when you see what we would refer to as weeds just right. common weeds uh, <laughs> growing on the side of the garage, you know, right. you don't realize how important, <laughs> how important these things are. Right. So what else do we want to cover? Um, let's see, uh, in the park district we have been doing pollinator programming for quite a while. Uh, I have been doing uh, monarch education, butterfly education for about five or six years. We uh, at Earth Day have been concentrating on pollinator education for many years. This year our theme for Earth Day, because it's our 10th anniversary, is to kind of bring all of those things that we've been doing the last 10 years to culminate in this beautiful event that is going to concentrate on citizen science. And that is where you as the resident of Oak Lawn can get involved in a volunteer program and report how many butterflies you see every year. That's or awesome count bees on sunflowers. We're going to be giving away lots of sunflower seeds so you can be part of the Great Sunflower Project and count, count the bees. So um, the counting bees is a whole different thing because yeah, bees are, are also in danger. They are. They are. Are they coming back? They... Um, I think that if we continue to encourage homeowners to put small pollinator pockets in their yards mm -hmm. and whatever you do as gardening in your own yard doesn't have to be large. It can be small, it just has to be the right plants in order to encourage those creatures that need the help to come. And uh, so you don't have to yeah. think about tearing up your whole backyard, it's but, not necessary. But, but plant with purpose. Plant with purpose, absolutely. Plant with purpose. And if someone has questions about this, who's watching at home, yes. can you uh, let us know how to reach you? And then we'll put it on the yes. screen below. You can reach me at uh, my email address at the Park District. Okay. Would be the best way. Okay. Can you just say it? So sure. it's it's defoster at olparks.com. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. I I am so appreciative of you coming out. We are <clears throat> anytime we could talk about spring, summer, and right. even fall, you know, this early in the season, it's exciting. Right. I love seeing the plants coming up and so we want to make sure every garden plant with purpose. Let's make habitat for the monarchs. Let's right. really make a difference. I think we can do it. I think we and can. And thank you so much for coming thank out. Thank you.